Hi, and welcome to this episode of Chess for Life in the Time of Corona. Today, we are very delighted to welcome John Saunders to the show. Now, John has a long history in chess publicity. He, at the moment, uh, works for various major tournaments, producing publicity reports and doing chess photography. Uh, he also used to um, update CFAX, so any of the English players will be very familiar with John Saunders CFAX reports from the 1990s and 2000s. He also uh, was the editor of BCM and Chess and author of the book How to Play Winning Chess. And he is also has um, a project he's doing at the moment called Britbase. Um, which compiles games and results throughout the years, throughout history of British chess. John, a big welcome to the show. Good morning, Natasha. Good morning, Matthew. Hi. John, can you start by telling us a little bit more um, about your chess publicity and, uh, and what you enjoy about uh, doing that? Well, it all started back in the 1990s when I was just a sort of amateur player. Um, but I was getting very bored with my middle management job. And I thought, well, this internet thing looks interesting. And funnily enough, it was my wife who wanted to have the internet. I was an IT professional and I thought, well, this sounds like a busman's holiday. I don't want to be using this thing in the evening. But anyway, she insisted on having the internet. And typically, of course, as soon as it was installed, I immediately hogged it, you know, she couldn't get anywhere near it because I loved it from the first moment. And I thought it would be a good idea um, to have a little project on the internet. I thought, well, Mark Crowther was already doing The Week in Chess, which I thought was really impressive. It was one of the first things I found on the internet. Of course, wonderfully, he's still doing it today in 2020, many years later. And I thought it would British Chess News, possibly can download games. So I set up a little internet um, site round about then, and that got me started. Excellent. And um, and what did your wife think at that stage? Um, she probably forgot what I looked like after a while. <laughs> I was closeted in the room where I'm sitting at the moment over the internet. In those days, of course, it used to cost a fortune because you connected via your, your telephone line. And if you remember, you had to pay the phone bill at the end of every month. That's I right. can remember my phone bill was going through the roof back in the 1930s. Because it's wonderful these days, you know, you play a, a flat rate. And no, she was very supportive. And she was working as well. I worked in, a, in an IT management job. Um, and she worked at the time for the Times Educational Supplement up in Wapping. Um, okay. But uh, later on, um, I had an approach made to me by Murray Chandler, and he saw what I was doing. He wanted something similar for BCM, for British Chess Magazine, because at the time he didn't have a website. So uh, I created a little website for him. And then a couple of years later, he came back to me again and said, well, you know, you created this website for, for me. How would you like to buy the business? <laughs> So that must was, have taken you a bit of come as a bit of a surprise. It certainly did. I was I was amazed when he approached me about that. To cut a long story short, I did I, I was joint owner, joint proprietor of British Chess magazine from nineteen ninety nine. I became the editor of the magazine. So I went from my IT middle management job to editing a chess magazine. Um, and it was it was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. I was doing something I loved. Um, it did mean, funnily enough, I didn't play as much chess. I used to be quite a keen player. But I discovered that when you're working in the chess field, in the chess industry, if we can call it that, you don't actually have very much time to play. Um, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. I enjoyed it editing the magazine, and I remained the editor for about 10 years before moving to Chess Magazine. I became the first person ever to have edited both our leading chess magazines in this country. So... And I'm still associated with Chess Magazine today as associate editor. I guess you must have been doing pretty much everything uh, in those days as editor of the BCM. So you, you were typesetting, I guess, as well, and uh, photo photos and... 
helping out in the shop occasionally when we were short of stock. <laughs> when you move into the chess industry, you know, you discover that the, the, the budgets you're working with compared to your old job, my, my old job was with the civil service where I was spending millions as a procurement manager buying massive computers. Suddenly, you divided the figure by about a thousand to get down to the sort of budget I, I had in the chess world. So yes, I did typesetting. I, of course, the chess photography started because um, I didn't want to have to pay photographers for their work. It was Murray Chandler again made this suggestion. He said, well, why don't you buy a digital camera? And when you go to tournaments, take your own pictures. You know, that would have saved a pound or two. So that saved a lot of money. And of course, it then provided me with another hobby because I really enjoyed chess photography as well. And have I you taken pictures of any famous games? Um, famous players? Uh, certainly have. I think I've taken pictures of every famous player you can think of apart from Bobby Fischer. Um, but anyone else you can name, I'm pretty sure I've got a picture of them. Um, I was the only person on hand as an example of a controversy when Hu Yifan played that funny game in Gibraltar a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. I was the only photographer in the room at the time, so any pictures you've seen of that were, were taken by me. Oh, wow. Um, I was just about to leave the room. It was quite funny, actually, because normally I will, I'll take pictures for the first five minutes, and then, of course, I'll leave the room to go and process my photos um, and possibly... A, a quieter camera or something like that and as I was going out the door I noticed there was something going on at this board so I just held my camera very quickly and took a couple of shots before I left the room and I hadn't realized what I'd taken a picture of. <laughs> can you can you describe it for uh, our listeners who might not be familiar with the oh with yes the game? okay well who you found in the last round of the Gibraltar tournament I think it was two years ago I can't I might have, have that wrong um, she was as a sort of protest against the pairings, she'd been paired against a number of women players in a row, and she wasn't happy about this. Um, and she, I think she felt it hadn't been explained to her. When she queried this with the arbiters, it had not been explained properly to her. So I think this was the last, it was the last round of the tournament. As a sort of protest, she played a beginner opening. I think she opened with something like F3 or G4 and allowed herself to be checkmated in about five moves okay. um, as a protest. And of course, this was a very odd thing to happen. But I, I sort of noticed that something, I mean, it, it, it was just instinct, really. I looked at the board and I could see an expression on, on her face. And I could see the look, people looking at the board looking very concerned. I had no idea what had happened. And I just went click, click with my camera. With your chess journalist instinct. Yeah. Whatever just, was happening, don't worry about the situation, just click. It was, it was just, you know, something's happening here, click, click, and then I walked out of the room because I'd finished my session. I was using Flash, and I was only allowed to use that for five minutes. So after that five minutes, I just leave the room to go and process my photos. And it was only then I went on the Internet and discovered from the general public what had actually happened. And, of course, this happens a lot when you're a chess journalist you actually discover things that are happening right in front of you, but you discover it from the internet yeah. in a weird way because you're working in an office next to where play is happening. But people at home actually are sitting watching these things in real time. So very often they see things... They're telling you what's going they're on. They're telling you. Yes, I've had that many times in Gibraltar when I've not seen something and then somebody put something on Twitter or on or social media, and I realise that something's happening in the next room, and I know nothing at all about it. And yeah. I can remember, I've I've had members of the public telling me to move cameras, and you know when we have video cameras set up, they're saying, oh, you know, you've got a video camera pointing at a board where the game's ended. Can you move the camera? You know, they're yeah. act, acting as show producers. They're sort of telling us to move cameras and things like that. That's back in the day. Of course, that's done much more professionally these days. But back in the day when we used to have a sort of a camcorder following play in some of the boards, the, the public can be very useful. Yeah. What about your own chess? Um, have you been playing much chess recently? Not at all, no, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm a very bad advert for your book, Chess for Life, because I, <laughs> as an old man, I've, I've basically given up playing. 
But you uh, have you've been you've been carrying on with chess, um, not just the play, but but the wider chess uh, exactly. throughout the life. Yeah, I like to I like to think I still worship Kaisa in my own way. Um, not I don't it, a bit like somebody who's very religious who doesn't go to church. I'm still very religious, even though I don't go to church myself. You understand what I'm saying? Um, so I mean, I feel I give back to chess. Um, yeah. I mean, I've always been involved in chess in other capacities. I used to run a club. I used to be match captain of a London league team. That used to keep me busy. Back yeah. in the which team? Which team were you captain of, John? Uh, Mitcham Chess Club. I'm afraid oh, yeah. we don't exist anymore. And I'm, okay. and it's a, one of those things. It's it's a typical story. We really only existed as a match playing club, and unfortunately, match playing clubs have a habit of disappearing when their players get to a certain age. Um, they tend to settle down and have responsible jobs and wives and families and things, and they give up playing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Clubs come to a, come to a sticky end. The only really good way to run a club to last, of course, is to have children playing and have club nights. Yes. Uh, and that, that way you recycle your chess players. Yes. Uh, as the old ones get old and die or go off and have families and have jobs, new ones come in. And of course yes. we do that. So we, we were all chaps in our 30s and 40s, um, bachelors and, you know, like hanging out in pubs and things. Um, but as life changed, you know, the club just came to a natural end. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I used to be the home secretary and I used to be the match captain for the London League team and the Surrey League team, so I did lots of that. Um, and I used to play in the 4NCL, I used to play for the South Wales Dragons. Oh yes. Because I'm technically Welsh, I don't sound very Welsh. My father was born in Wales, my mother was actually Scottish, so I'm, I'm a bit of a mixture. Um, I used to play for them, and of course, um, when I started my British chess news on the internet, one of the things I did was to put games from the 4NCL um, onto the internet. Um, and in fact, I got co-opted by Nigel Johnson, who was running the 4NCL back in the day, and he asked me if I would be the webmaster for the 4NCL. Because uh, that's right, you were, you were one of the earliest games inputters, weren't you, for the 4NCL? I, I was the first. I was the, the very, very first games inputter. And back in the day, the 4NCL was small enough for me to do all of the games played in, in the day. I'm quite quick. I could get that done by dinner time and get them out on the internet by about midnight. Um, That's amazing. And you had actually already played as well. I, I used to you play. You played well. your game and then input all the games from the day by midnight. Completely crazy. Back in the 1990s, I don't know how I did it. I also used to play in little 10-player, um, all-play-all norm tournaments. Oh, yes. Uh, if you remember, Adam Ralph used to organise lots of these. Yes, I remember, yes. In the 1990s. I think he got some sponsorship from somebody. Um, and he held lots of fantastic little 10-player, all-play-all tournaments. And technically, I was a norm seeker, although my chances of ever getting an IM norm were a bit... Did you ever get a norm? Never got a norm. Ne okay. Never even got close to a norm. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I ever got a 2300 rating in a tournament. I came close mm -hmm. to 23. I nearly got FM. I didn't yeah. even get FM. Um, but I can remember playing in one of those in Cardiff in about 1998. I think the games input by me are, are on Megabase somewhere. Um, and I played in this tournament and I input the games and I set up a website for the tournament as well. I mean, that was just crazy. But it was hugely enjoyable. I mean, I loved playing in that. And if I tell you the names of the players in it, and most of them are now grandmasters, there was Luke McShane, yes. um, uh, Simon Williams, um, Danny Gormally, I think yeah. there was um, Sebastian Siebrecht from Germany. Oh, yes. And these are all grandmasters today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think there were three IM norms in that tournament. Unsurprisingly, Luke McShane, yeah. uh, Danny Gormally, and I think somebody else, James Cobb, got an IM norm as well. Oh yes, James Cobb. I haven't, I haven't seen him for a long time. No, I think he's probably retired or taken. Retired, a like a lot of players. Yeah. Yes, but I remember getting absolutely hammered in this. So I got a draw with Luke, and that was quite commendable. Um, Very good. He was about twelve at the time, so. It yeah. Better, like, better to do that when he's 12. Yeah, yeah catch them when they're young. Yeah, so I yeah. just scraped a draw with him. 
Uh, but I did win my last round game. So it's one, of, it's one of these strange things in chess. If you win in the last round, you go home happy. Oh, but yes, definitely. How many games That's the game that matters. <laughs> you go and how home would you, John, how would you describe your chess style? And your, Are you attacking player? Uh, no, uh, definitely not. Um, I would, I've sort of perhaps been a bit cruel to myself, but I'm sort of poor man's Anish Geary. Um, <laughs> You, um, as in you get a lot of draws. I get a lot of draws. Um, Remind me, John, what was the title of the book that you wrote? <laughs> <laughs> uh, how to Play Winning Chess. Excellent. Yes, which all my friends thought was, was hilarious because um, I can't remember the last time I won a game of chess, actually, because I, I haven't played for about 10 years and I had a run of lots of games without winning any. Um, and I, it was probably about 15 years ago that I last won a game of chess, I should So today it's 17th of April 2020 and yesterday uh, the government announced another three weeks of lockdown at least um, in the efforts to fight the coronavirus. John, how have, have you been affected by the coronavirus at all um, and how's lockdown affecting your work? I haven't been affected by the coronavirus. I'm glad to say I've not caught it. Um, I'm in a household here just with my wife. We don't have any children, so it's just her and me. We're both retired. Um, we're both able to get get our shopping done after a fashion, so basically we're okay here. Uh, we have a garden as well, which is nice, so we can go to the garden. Yeah. I, I do feel sorry for people who are stuck in small flats, which must be very difficult. We also have open spaces quite near us. I can go down, to, just walk to the end of the road, and we have the River Thames and the towpath, and I can take a, a short walk down there, although it's a bit like a velodrome these days, I have to say. Oh, really? Lots of cyclists. <laughs> Lots of cyclists and joggers. There's more people than I ever remember going up and down the Thames, which is you know, fair enough if they're living in flats or whatever, um, and they need to get out and get some exercise. But really, we haven't been affected by it. Um, one member of my family has had coronavirus, oh, my nephew, who's 45, and, and his wife, in fact, I learned yesterday, um, they've recovered from it. Um, they're not in recovery, so they've not been badly affected. Um, Did it knock them out for a bit, or are they...? Yes, yes, they, yeah. they didn't have to go into hospital. They, they stayed yeah. at home and um, recovered at home. I think they're okay now. That's great. Um, I haven't, my, my mother and father died some years ago. I have an elderly aunt at age 90 who lives on her own in Marlow, um, but she's a great character and she knows how to use computers. Oh, good. So, yeah. um, and I, I chat to her every day. She's also got marvellous neighbours um, who leave food on her doorstep for her. And she told me the other day she feels like a baby bird on a nest. <laughs> People bringing food. To her. So, <laughs> she's bearing up extremely well. Uh, she's got a very nice house and a nice garden. And I think she's one of the lucky ones. Um, so, in personal terms, I've not been affected by it. Um, I like to go bird watching in Richmond Park. I like to oh, do yes. photography. Um, unfortunately, I can't really justify doing that. Um, I don't know what people would think if they saw me walking a mile to the park from a great big long lens. It doesn't, <laughs> look, it doesn't look like, well, I suppose that might be part of my exercise regime, carrying, mm. carrying a camera. Um, I heard I heard on the news yesterday that actually a lot of people are taking up bird watching at the moment, and and that's a new a newly found interest for the British public. Well, that's fantastic if that's true. Yes, that, that sounds very very possible. In fact, I have been doing that. I've been taking pictures of birds in my back garden. Yeah. Normally, yeah. I go to the park to do that, but I've been following the the, uh, the progress of a, a pair of blackbirds which are nesting in our hedge at the moment. And there's house sparrows and parakeets we get in London, of course. Oh, yes, uh, yes. If you're aware of that, we get lots of parakeets um, and all sorts of other birds. So, yes, I do take an interest in, in the birds in the back garden. So I have to say I'm, I'm not really affected by it. Obviously, it's a terrible tragedy for um, people who've lost loved right. ones. Um, so I almost feel guilty that I'm so unaffected by it. But, of course, yeah. you know, famous last words. Who knows what the future yeah. may so um, yes. And in terms of your work, are you are you carrying on as normal? 
Yes, well, in fact, my work has nearly always been um, conducted in, in, in self-isolation anyway. <laughs> all, all my work for the last 20 years has been conducted pretty well from where I'm sitting now in my tiny little study in my house in Kingston upon Thames. Um, I, I just wish I had a bigger a bigger room to work in, but you know, I've been <laughs> about 20 years. I've been writing my, I do a, an opinion piece for Chess Magazine every month, and I've been writing that as usual. Um, I've been editing Brit Base. I've been people have been sending me games from from the past, which I've been adding to the collection of Brit Base. Um, I've been I've also tried to organise my photograph catalogue or collection, which I think is somewhere in excess of thirty thousand photos. Oh my goodness! Uh, it's, it's getting a bit unmanageable. What, what I'm trying to do is to see if I can. Um, arrange it so that I can actually find photos quickly. Yeah. I get people occasionally asking me for photos and I need to be able to type in a name and up pops all the photos of that particular person. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can nearly do that but not quite. One of the problems being I've got a whole array of hard disks on which all the photographs sit. There's far too many just to sit on the hard disk of a, of a computer. So lots of little jobs in chess, you know, there's lots of little things that I can be going on with. Yeah. Okay, John, so you've selected um, a, a game to go through, which we'll go through in a minute. What game have you selected and why? Well, I've se selected my own game uh, against Dave Rumens from the Birmingham University Open Tournament in 1978. Um, I think it probably displays my own, um, the way I used to play chess quite well. Also, it's it's a good sort of cheapo at the end. It's typical of me because it, the game is drawn. Um, this is me achieving my ultimate objective in chess, which is to draw games. To draw every game. <laughs> <laughs> like Anish Giri. Um, and there's a little story attached to it. Dave Rumens, of course, died a couple of years ago. He's a well, very well-known character in British chess. Um, there's a very good obituary written about him, I think, on the English Chess Forum possibly on the English Chess Federation website as well. Uh, he was a great character. In 1977, he actually won what we used to call, well, I think we still, still call the Grand Prix, which is the sort of um, prize given to people who do the best in the weekend tournaments in Britain. And he actually won this in 77, which is quite a coup, because I think previous to him, it had been won by people like Tony Miles, John Nunn, you know, top grandmasters, uh, used to play in the weekenders and, and win the prize. I think the prize was quite a good one. I suspect it was about £2,000 first prize, which back yeah. in 77 was, was worth going for. Um, anyway, he won it in 77. In 78, though, he, he, had, he was given a run for his money by Andrew Whiteley, who's another, another much-loved um, member of the chess community. And before the game, when Dave Rumen sat down to play me in this game, which I think was in the third round of the tournament, both of us had two out of two. Um, as we started the game, he, he didn't wind me up, but he did wind up Andrew Whiteley at the next board because Andrew had dropped a half point against somebody or other. I can't remember who it was. Um, and Dave Rumen was winding him up because obviously he was his rival for the Grand Prix. He said, well, you, you must have thought this is this was going to be a cakewalk for, for you. You know, you saw old Dave Rumens winning the Grand Prix in 77, so if he can win it, anyone can, you know. So this is Dave Rumens self-satirising to Andrew Whiteley. So as they sat down to play, this, this was the conversation. So that sort of seed neatly into the game. I, I listened into this with great interest. Of course, my strategy in this game was I was quite fearful of playing Dave Rumens. I was a real coward when I played chess. <laughs> and I was trying to think of ways to try and neutralise him. I knew he was a very attacking player, so I'd, I'd had to try and steer him into my own favourite boring forms of chess. So you, you'll see as the game starts that that was my yeah. that was my plan, although it didn't work terribly well. Brilliant! Thank you very much for telling us all about your work, um, and let's get on and see the game. Fantastic! Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, so your favourite move, John, was? E4. E4. 
E5 from uh, from Dave. Oh, Dave Rumens, he, he used to play the Marshal, didn't he? I think with um, against the Lopez. I seem to remember he was. I think he... Yes, I think that's right. I was obviously very fearful of him. Um, funnily enough, E5 is already a problem for me. <laughs> I'm such a late chess player. <laughs> I, I, I played chess for decades without really having a good white system. Um, for years, I used to play the Ponzi army. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> it, I mean, it's great for Blitz. It can, it's brilliant for Blitz. Yeah. Indeed. Um, but, but for standard play... Um, Black players, even if they don't know any theory, can simply sit down and work out all the good moves. Yeah, because you yeah. can more or less do it, you can logic it out, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, I didn't, I didn't play that here. I, I played um, Bishop C4. Uh, I never played the Lopez because I was, throughout my 40 years of act, active chess play, I never sat down to learn the theory. Okay. So these, these sort of you know, Heath Robinson systems. Which I didn't play very well. Anyway, we'll move on quickly from here. So this can get quite sharp if Black plays Knight F6 here. It can do, um, except that I I thought, well, I could play Knight G5, mm. which is what I would do if I wasn't playing Dave Rubin. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, he would have loved that. Just uh... he would have just creamed me if I played <laughs> that. I mean, that's like if if he'd been three hundred rating points lower. Without question, I would have played knight g5. But anyway, d3, which is what they all play these days, you know. Exactly, yeah, I know this is... Um, I think, was it John Nunn started playing lots of d bishop c4, d3 in the 80s or something? I can't remember now. I think you I think you're right yeah John was John was very uh, John was also um he introduced the four knights you know knight c3 and bishop b5 a lot at at, at the top level as well I mean uh, yeah I mean John was behind a lot of these uh, uh, um slightly annoying side li- or annoying sidelines you know against with with one e4 so uh it's uh but Dave Rubens went bishop e7 That's it yeah and uh, um, knight c3 ooh yes what do you think of that, Matthew? Yeah. Well, it's it's old fashioned, John. That, that's 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 what I'll say. Yes, it was nineteen seventy eight. That's right. <laughs> so D six. Just died. D six and Bishop E three. Now, no, I honestly, I have looked at this position, and I think Bishop E three really is a bad move. Um, I think you have to, from what I, I can remember looking at, is you don't play a3 or a4 to get your bishop. Yeah, a3, yeah, that, that's right. a3, yeah, a4 so, as well is, uh, would be uh, would be quite reasonable. Yeah, bishop e3 is, uh, is uh, yeah. So this is the first of my bad moves, and it's not going to be the last. <laughs> um, so, um, I, sh- I mean, I... We've obviously discussed the title of my book, but this should be titled How Not to Play Bishop. <laughs> um, bishop is not a great move because he plays knight a5. Um, I then played h3. And I realised there's nothing much I can do about the bishop. So I played my, my piffling little h3 move, which is probably okay. He played uh, c6. c6. And now, of course, I play a3, hoping he's forgotten about my bishop on c4. <laughs> Unfortunately, oh, he, he remembered. He remembered, and he took it. I thought, oh dear, this is going to be difficult. I thought, never mind. I can sort of block position in some weird way. Uh, um, it'll be okay. I mean, I, I've had these sort of things before with White. And against lesser players, it's less of a problem. But I thought, well, anyway, we can move through some of these moves very quickly. I think. Queen e two, bishop e six. Knight D2. Knight D2 is a bit passive. Any, any thoughts on that, Matthew? Like well, yeah, it does give him does give him D5 very easily, really. So, um, yeah. um, that's uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, Rook D1 looks looks natural, or um, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe throwing a Knight G5 somewhere, uh, maybe. But um, uh, yeah, this is uh, now Black's Black's got uh, Black's got a nice position now. Where that's uh, two bishops yeah, and. Yeah, and the way I looked at it, I, I remember thinking, well, he's simply playing to get the two bishops and get them active. And then yeah. he's simply going to play, play the position, basically. Exactly, um, yeah. Yeah. And I thought, well, I haven't got a plan, really, to be honest. I, I just have to, I'm, I'm now reacting to his plan. 
I've he, already gone passive. Yeah, it's a little bit as if you're playing black, really, isn't it? Uh, now that's just yeah. Um, yeah. it's. Um, so you took off and played c4, rook c1, all very normal, and I'm sure. Oh, Dave went to a5. A4. Yeah, getting to me. <laughs> Rook D8, 95. Oh, yeah. That was interesting to think, yes, that's right. I went zooming over there, living in, in hope. I mean, how fast was Dave playing? Was, was he a fast player or, or a slow player? Yes, he was quite fast. I think the time limit for this tournament was 40 in an hour and three quarters plus 15 minute add on at the end. Which is more of a problem for me than him. I think I was in, in time trouble. I was the one suffering. Okay, yeah. So the game could be four hours at most. Yes. I remember in those sort of days, or maybe a bit later than that, that we used to have these kind of county matches and you'd have a break for sandwiches in the middle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they didn't, they stopped the clocks, but they stopped the clocks, but, but everyone would have their positions still going and you'd yeah, have a little chat. Yeah. How are you doing? Oh, yeah, fine. <laughs> a bit worried my king's about to get mated, but other than that, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, so you, you, it was always slightly annoying if your opponent was the one to move, and they were still yeah. having a sneak. Having a little bit of a there. think, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, di yeah, different times, I think. <laughs> People would be very sniffy about that stage, wouldn't they? Oh, good lord, yes. Good lord. <laughs> so, um, uh, Queen H5, John. Yeah. Yeah, well, we're going to see this once or twice in this game where I'm so desperate, I just play the crudest move on the board. But to be honest, what, what else What else is there? It's just no, not you, great. Yeah, no, you're, you're in a bit of trouble here. This bishop on b3 is enormous, actually. It's, uh, and Black's, Black's got a very simple plan, just doubling up on the d-file, pushes f-pawn, and uh, yeah. No, it's, it's pretty... It's pretty... So, I think my mindset here was I'm probably going to lose this game. I won't be, I'm not too bothered about how I lose it, um, but I may as well, despite having played very passively in the early stages yeah. of the game, I have to play a little bit more actively and see if something turns up. Try and get a great play. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, what can you do? You know? So anyway, so I played back to e4 here. Didn't I? That's right, and he went, and he played rook a6. Yeah, yeah. He's, all, all his moves kind of work easily, don't they? Mine, mine are harder to come by. Um, rook C3. I played, I rook C3. Yeah, so I thought, yeah, I thought, well, if he can play a rook lift, so... Ah, indeed. <laughs> I suppose I'm trying to support my poor little seaport, but I could see that in the long run. But yeah, it's a... Rook e6, I suppose, is a slightly mysterious move. I didn't really understand rook e6. No, not really. I think he was maybe worried you were going to play f4, so he thought he'd um, he'd have his rook there, but um, just to attack your, your knight on e4. I think that's probably um, that's probably it. Um, it's not... You, you maybe wouldn't think it was completely necessary, but, um, I mean, it's, um, it's, a, it's a decent move. And then he attacks your c pawn. Oh, a knight coming in. John. Indeed. Knight coming into f5. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Definitely threatening something somewhere. Bishop f8. Not really threatening anything. Right, it's... It? Well, because he put, puts a bishop back on f8. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I think now I managed to... No, actually, the... I was in time trouble now. I think I just supported this sequel. That's I? right. Yeah. yeah. And he played king h7. Yeah. Yeah, King H seven just to to play G six and F five and uh, and finally get that F five break in. I think King H seven. Yeah, it's a very nice move, and I I retreat with Knight G three. But of course, this is this is going from bad to worse. To be honest, after G six, I think I ought to bring the Queen all the way back to E two because after playing to H four, it's got virtually no squares at all. Yeah, yeah, it's it's all F five. This is. Uh... This is all looking quite nasty. Knight f1. <laughs> yeah, now this is much more typical me putting on the back right. <laughs> f4, bishop d2. Oh. Ooh. Yeah, it's just, it gives you physical pain, doesn't it, to have to put your pieces bishop e6. Square. Uh, this it does look like black has all the chances in this. Yeah. Game. 
it, it, it gets worse for a little bit. You wouldn't believe it, but it gets worse. Yeah, things are going to get worse before they get better, to yeah. <laughs> phrase we here at the moment. Um, Bishop E6. I did spot that he was threatening Bishop E7 to trap my queen. Here, so I'm, at least I'm, I'm seeing... <laughs> I'm seeing the big threat. And I thought, well, how do I get out of that? Indeed. And I have to put F3. F3. gave me physical pain. Because <laughs> it's so awful, isn't it? I mean, everything about my position is just awful. Yeah. I'm starting to think about resigns. Is resigns not quite yet, but, you know, <sighs> the pub's not open yet. <laughs> that is always the important consideration, yes. It's... Uh... <laughs> So Bishop C5, yes, he, he can take that with check now, unfortunately. And he took your pawn there because, uh, yeah, if we go, uh, this trick doesn't work anymore because uh, you capture with, he captures with check, doesn't he? So uh, he goes check and you can't, can't take that rook on D8. So King, King H1. Yeah, yeah. So um, we carry on with the. B6 is sort of annoying little move to torture me because I haven't got any moves. This is what you do, isn't it? Yeah, it's true. Like that. It's true. That's what you can do, yeah. Move to e emphasize. Yeah, that's, that's very chessy, actually, because um, uh, oh, well, we've been playing shogi uh, a lot recently, and uh, you can't do this sort of thing in shogi. If you, if you start waiting, then uh, the opponent has a piece where they can drop pieces onto the board, and there's always something that can be dropped. But with chess, you can really you know keep control like that. It's... Uh, it's quite a big, uh, quite a big difference in uh, in the two games. So Queenie one. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't drop a white square bishop on e four. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, it's not legal at this this form of chess that we play. So Queenie one. Here we go. Typical Saunders. It was probably just as well that there weren't too many of my Mitchum colleagues here because they'd all be laughing at me putting my pieces on the back rank. I was very famous for this. Um, it's typically the way I played the King's Indian. I would usually make some silly mistake and all my pieces would end up on the back rank and I'd get pushed off the board. But having it happen with white, I suppose, is even more ignominious. <laughs> anyway, Queen D1, yes. Queen D6. Um, he now, he now, yeah, this is quite nice way. He now does. He plays Queen D6. Uh, and um, Queen D4. Yeah, Queen D4 is coming. I... I don't think I don't think there's any point in dis our discussing good moves for me now because I don't think there are any. But it's just how not to be mated. Indeed, indeed, and I think Rook C five is the uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't think there's much alternative. No, no, that's the. Uh... So, so I lop off, I lop off the bishop and count the material and think, well, this isn't great because I'm just the exchange and a poor one. <laughs> Exchange and a pawn. So, does you know? Should I resign? Am I morally obliged to resign this position? Never. <laughs> Never. Never. <laughs> Never. We'll play on. I thought you know, I could do, but I'll play a couple. I've got. A, I've still got a few pieces left on the board. Um, Bishop. Bishop looks quite good on C3. It does actually. Yes, that uh, that turns out turns out pretty well. Queen F2. Turns out well. Yes, Queen D three, Queen F two. Not not exchanging off. Exactly. You can't. Less. There are fewer cheapos if the queens are off the board. There's more cheapos chances. You never know your luck. So Bishop. I, F I already have my eye on that long diagonal. Indeed. If I get re really really lucky, I might be able to get that long diagonal. Bishop F five. That's right. Yes. Rookie mm, one. Rookie one. Can't really do anything at the moment. Indeed. So. And he plays well, e4. Ooh, e4, e4. Probably a good move, but, um, but feels a little bit risky. Feels a little bit risky. <laughs> In some ways, he doesn't take have to take any risks at all. And the only criticism I have of his play it was that he sometimes... You know, he could just exchange things, you know, just organise yeah. the exchange. Uh, he could play rook takes c3 and just win. No, actually, that's not quite true, is it? Rook takes c3. Yeah, it takes, it's not quite I mean, no, that's not quite so Yeah, I mean, maybe um, the move that sort of uh, appeals is rook dd5, I have to say. Okay. Just to, um, to, to hold everything like that. 
Um, because if, if white, if you try knight d2, um, uh, then I can go rook takes c3. You know, that's quite, uh, um, so you yes. can't, you can't get your knight onto e4. If you go queen h4, then I could go probably g5. Um, and, um, if you, if you go on a bit of an adventure like this, then, um, um, I don't know. I mean, I could even just swap off the queens like that. Yes. Something yes. like that. And I think rook dd5, I think, I think, yeah, black's, black's really in, in complete control there. So, uh, uh, a bit hard to think what, um, what white could do. Um, yeah. and, uh, and probably, but you know, what, if, what, what, yeah. yeah, I mean, if black gets in g5 first of all, and then plays e4 afterwards, then it's probably quite nice. But, uh, e4 is, is probably still fine, but it's, it's, a, it's a touch risky. It's definitely a touch risky. And you start to dream again. That's the problem, isn't it? Yeah, long diagonal. Long, long diagonal. Long di it, it sort of, yeah, it kind of opens up the E and the F file for fantasies for my rook and queen. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, we're, we're living in a realm of fantasy here. In this game, certainly. So I, I exchanged the pawns. And... 92. Ooh, not afraid of Queen H3. Apparently not. <laughs> I wonder, actually. Um, no, it doesn't, actually. I mean, uh, well, King G1. He could take a lot of stuff off the board there, couldn't he? Yeah, I mean... Queen G oh, yeah, Queen G2 and then Rook, and rook takes C. Yeah, I mean, you could do it. Um, oh, this is all. Yes, you could take, take and take. So if king g2, we've got rook takes c3. I suppose you could, um, you, you have always got this uh, this rook check on here, but I could probably, king g8 would probably be quite uh, quite decent again. I mean, you'll have rook takes c3 and rook d2. So that, that might well have, uh, that might well have worked. Yes. Um, I think, um, just thinking whether bishop g2, bishop g2 would be too risky. But um, but uh, Queen G two does look quite uh, does look quite good. But um, but I have to say, I mean, yeah, these are the types of positions you, you don't. Yeah, when you when you think uh, you know a couple of moves ago you were nice and safe, and then all of a sudden you've got to start calculating lines. I mean, it's really uh, yeah, it's really not what you want to do. So he played rookie eight, rookie eight, covering the the bishop on e four. And um, and also, well, I, I suppose just uh, threatening to to move the rook over to g five or h five. And um, yes. and you played knight f three, maximum resistance. That's excellent. <laughs> yes, true. No, I mean you just you don't allow force wins, and you just keep on going. You know that's uh, that's always the way to do it. It's. Um, I mean, the psychology of these sort of positions is very funny, isn't it? Because you know. When normal, a normal game of chess, both players are quite tense all of the time until somebody gets a totally lost position, at which point the psychology changes completely. The player with a lost position becomes resigned to their fate. The tension lifts, the anxiety lifts, and I think, well, I've lost anyway. So exactly. <laughs> and all of that tension that you've suffered is suddenly lumped onto your opponent who have the obligation to win a one game. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It uh, takes a lot of nerves to win a one game, you know, and um, I do think that that's the, that's actually the thing I find the most remarkable about, um, you know, about the, um, well, actually the GMs like uh, Keith and uh, Keith Arkell and Mark Hebden, you know, who... Uh, who managed to to win game after game after game in um, uh, in weekend tournaments? I mean, it takes a lot of takes a lot, a lot of nerves, you know, to to do that, uh, you know, in so many games, you know, and uh, and I, I found that always very tough in uh, in chess. It cost me a lot of energy every time, you know, to be uh, completely uh, concentrated for finishing off games. It's uh, so yeah. So let's. remarkable thing about Keith and Mark is is just to watch them sitting at the board. They sit like a statue. Yes. Yeah. They, they don't move a muscle because this is their this is simply their workplace. This is their desk where they do their work. Yeah. They, they sit there like they're doing their nine to five job, and they don't engage emotionally with the game. Really, they just treat it as, as as the thing that they do. And I think that's remarkable that they can maintain that over so many years. Yeah. I've yeah. Got tremendous admiration for 
both Mark and Keith. Yeah, Mickey yeah. Adams is another example of a player who shows no emotion when he's playing. Yeah, uh, Mickey. Yeah, M- Mickey was. Uh, Mickey was. Yeah, just fantastic. I mean, uh, well, still is fantastic. It's uh, just. Um, yeah, I know Mickey. Mickey. Uh, when when he, when he was uh, when. He, Especially when he when, when when he was young, he just looked like he wasn't trying at all. Nowadays, when you sit next to him, I sat next to him at the Olympiad uh, in uh, in Tromso, and you really notice how much effort is going in there. You know, it's uh, he's really uh, really concentrating very hard. But when he was younger, it just looked effortless. Really, you know, he just seemed to be uh, just think be thinking, just barely thinking at all, and uh, and playing. Um, so let's have a look. How did Dave Rumins do this? All oh, Queen D seven. Dave Rumins is retreating. Yes, forcing him back. And Queen H4. Queen H4, yeah, I've got to get that Queen H4 move in. It's beginning to look like something. It's definitely starting to look like something. And, I mean, actually, you know, Black's only a pawn up uh, in the exchange. So, I mean, if you, you know, you think Rook takes C3 and just get rid of everything and you'll be fine. But then you're only a pawn up, you know, which uh, which would be a bit of a shame, really, after, after having been so dominating. Oh, Bishop F3. How did Dave play this? Can you remember, John? Did he play it with a big thump, or did he... Uh... <laughs> I honestly can't remember. I think I was... Um, I don't know, really. Um, no, I can't remember. I'd be lying if I told you I could remember how he played it. <laughs> should take a three, and that's right. I, um, Are you I think it's a job working the position out now. Rook takes... Oh, of course, yes. Okay. Rook takes the eight. Oh, Oh, Bishop G2. Bishop G2 now. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, sure takes. So, yeah. Oh, you I'm took it? Oh, good Lord. Okay. We can, uh, we can just sort oh, sorry, of... No, it's it's yeah, it's fine. It's gone. Ah, it's, it's gone, gone back. Sorry. There's a little, there's a bit of lag, you know, it's, uh, well, it's coming from 1978, John, of course. So, you know, it's having to make its way from quiet away. Way away. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yes. So yeah. I'm, I'm reading the moves from my scorebook, which I wrote with my quill pen. Oh, good lord! <laughs> and 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 John, in those days, were you using algebraic notation or descriptive notation? So oh. I mean, when I saw the chess, I was doing knight to king's bishop three type and pawn to king four. Absolutely, I was I was a descriptive man until about nineteen. Well, in fact, what caused the change for me? was when I, I lived abroad from 1975 to 1977, didn't play any chess. And until then, I used descriptive notation. But when I returned to Britain, I thought, well, you know, I've lived on the continent. It's time to go continent. <laughs> so I must start using um, algebraic notation. So in fact, my, my ancient scorebook, which I'm holding up here, is actually um, it's all in algebraic, I think. My goodness. Because, oh, uh... no, actually, this scorebook, this scorebook starts in descriptive notation. Okay. But now on game fifty of a fifty game scorebook, and I've changed to ah, because it, 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 it's illegal now, isn't it? Uh, descriptive notation. I think you're only allowed to record in algebraic. I think. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, you have to have a special dispensation, possibly for the Pope. I, don't know. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I remember Stuart Rubin told me that when Michael Franklin played in the four MCL, he just couldn't get used to using algebraic. So Stuart said, you carry on using descriptive, it's fine, Michael. And of course, Michael writes in the most immaculate descriptive notation. Um, so I, and I used to be the game inputter, so I, I, I used to know all the people who wrote their games in exactly. notation. But just talking about Michael Franklin, who, um, yeah, I mean, British viewers will, will, will remember him as well. I mean, uh, really, really, really strong player, uh, played the collet all the time, um, all his life. And uh, but I heard that um, that he never kept his score sheets. That he just threw them away as soon as the ge- as soon as the the uh, the game was gone. Yeah, I, uh, regrettably, I think I might have been the, the original source of that story. I, I, you know, I did I contact him? No, I got somebody to contact him to to find out because I wanted to. There's one thing actually I could do that here and now. I'd love to get hold of lots of games played by. Um, sort of the, old, the older members of our um, sort of chess community. Yeah. I've done this for Bird Cafferty. I've collected all his games and put them online on my website, Britbase. I um, hope, hope people go and have a look at that. I've collected lots of British It's fantastic. I mean, anyone watching it really, yeah, really is fantastic. A great source of British chess games. Um, thank you. Yes, and I'd, I'd love to have done that for Michael Franklin, but you're absolutely right. As far as we know, 
he just chucked away his score sheets. And I think that applies to a surprising number of players. I've always kept all of my games. I haven't put all my games on BritBase because I'm ashamed of it. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll do it in, in, this is just one I'll contribute, but this is very typical of my game. <laughs> <laughs> very, I definitely played one against Michael Franklin, and he beat me, and it was one of these very quiet games. He started white as D4, but I don't know if I've got that score sheet anywhere, because it would probably be when I was a kid. Yeah, I mean, I, I was very lucky. My dad uh, wrote all of my uh, score scores in uh, um, when I was young, so uh, I've got a complete record of of all my games when I was when I was little, you know. But uh, otherwise, I probably would, uh, yeah, I probably wouldn't have uh, have had them. Um, let's let's keep on going because we've we've left this position in a in in a, in, a, in an absolutely thrilling state here. So, uh, king takes g two, queen e eight, queen f six, no. Yes. Well, when I played this, yes. And of course, when when I played this move, I thought, well, you know, this is a triumph of hope over experience. Really. And I looked at, the, I already looked at the position. I thought, well, he can play queen e two check. He can simply take my bishop. Um, rook g and rook b five check looks fantastic. Yeah, I mean, but queen I queen c six check is also yeah. is also very strong. Just swapping off the queens. Yes. Sorry, I meant to say that. I thought, well, he'll just play queen c six check. And I'll have to resign, because how can I play on in that position? It's ridiculous, isn't it? Because he's the exchange, and two pawns up, in fact, isn't he? Indeed, I yes. Resign. Indeed. I couldn't believe it. And, and I thought, well, he's, he, he, he was having a think, and I thought, well, he's obviously looking at queen e2 check. So I looked at that, and I thought, that looks like mate to me. I'm like, it looks pretty bad, yeah. Yeah, it looks pretty bad as well, queen e2 check. Um... Queen to the G file, I think. Yeah, it's all going to be a bit tricky, isn't it? Because we'll, we'll, we'll check you, we'll check you like this, and we'll we'll check you like this, and we'll check you like this, and then we'll bring our rook across, and that's going to be uh, exactly. that's going to be that's going to be very bad. And that looked like late, you know, I don't know, three or four, I would have thought, after that. Yeah, I think so. So I was sort of sit sitting there idly thinking, well, he's going to do that. And then, of course, he plays rook g5 check. And I thought, oh, that's surprising. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm probably, I'm still expecting to lose. Well, I thought, well, doesn't that make it just slightly more difficult? Um, because he's going to have to go all in now. Because I do, I mean, that is a bit of a threat I've got. There. Yeah, indeed. Um, so he has to, he has to go all in. I was quite surprised to see rook g5 check. Um, and I can't remember whether uh, I played king f1. I have to yeah. be quite careful. But yeah. One of the things about this game is that I played all the bad moves in the first half of the game. In the second half of the game, I'm being forced to play moves. <laughs> I have, have almost no choice about the moves I make for the rest of the game. It's just a question of rejecting the obviously bad moves that get mated in about three. And whatever you're left with, you have to make. Exactly. He lulled him into bad. a false sense of security. He thought he could play anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's the funny thing. If we, if we look at the position before you play rook g5 check, sometimes when you give your opponent a lot of choices, they go wrong. I mean, yeah. We spend so much time when we play chess trying to reduce the number of choices our opponent has. But when you're desperate, sometimes you have to reverse it yeah. <laughs> and try and give so many chances that they might just pick a bad choice. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's absolutely true. You should never underestimate the, the ability of people to get just somehow to, to, uh, to, to see three very good possibilities and then choose a fourth one that's bad, actually. That's, uh, that's normally how it goes. It's uh, so King F one, and I, I suppose did he give a he gave a Queen B five check? Yeah, which looks pretty good. Well, I think it is pretty good. Um, I think he's still winning. King F two. King F two. Queen C five check. And now, of course, he's. I pretty much have to play. Do I pretty much have to play Bishop, Bishop D four? Yeah, yeah. No, otherwise his uh, his Queen gets in with. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Otherwise, it's, uh, yeah. You, you've got to cover this g1 square. If uh, if king f1, then uh, he'll go rook g1, or probably even queen g1 as well. So uh, queen c2 now. 
That's it. Yeah, Queen C2. And I, I still think, I probably still am losing. Well, I couldn't quite see. And of course, we are. Are we coming up to the time control, or is this after the time control? Move 48, so you're, yeah, you're, you're quite a bit past. So uh... We're past the time control, so we're into the 15-minute add-on. But I think he had plenty of time. I don't think he was in time trouble. I'm guessing I probably had 5 or 10 minutes myself, and I'm guessing he probably had about 20 or 25 minutes, because I don't think he was in time trouble. Anyway, Queen C2 check. King E1. Rain. Sneaky. King E1. Exactly. Yeah, this is very important, actually, isn't it? Because uh, uh, if king f3, you'd go uh, queen g2 check, and then uh, rook f5 would uh, would be uh, would be rather painful. So king e1. Oh, good lord! Um, let's have a look. How does he? Hmm. He has to worry about the mate now. Yeah. Indeed. Um, so I would have thought. I would have thought. Queen B1 or something? What did he do? Oh, Queen C1. That's uh, seems sort of. Although, yeah, I don't know. It feels uh, feels a little bit strange. Queen C1, but probably not bad. King E2. G2 check. And King F3. Indeed. Here comes the king. Here comes the king. Indeed. Here comes the king. Yeah, and and I was I was still in a bit of a trance at this point thinking well you know this is interesting I, I'll be interested in how he mates me I just assume he's going to mate me. <laughs> I mean it was gradually dawning on me well I can sort of wander up the board of my king you know I can get to about d5 and I can't quite see how he's going to win then yeah I'm, um, I'm in fact I can't remember what what the mistake is now it's not actually in my score book I think he might have already gone wrong I'm not sure there's a win here well it it's might... It's certainly it's certainly a little bit tricky. I'm, I'm, I was I was I was looking at, uh, at going. Uh, uh, what did he do? He went yeah, rook g three, king e four, queen h one. I mean, what he, what he did um, actually was uh, is very very reasonable. But but yeah, it looks good. <laughs> you yeah, just keep going up. <laughs> oh my goodness me! He's, he's managed to reorganise his queen and rook so that he's got control of d five, but. It doesn't seem to do him any good. No, I, I think it's already gone. I, I think I did look at this with a with a computer. I, yeah, I can't remember what the the, the maybe it was Queen C one check. I can't remember now. But, or it might have been just. I don't think it was Rook G five check. But the wind's just not there. I just don't think it's there. Anymore. No, no. I think uh, I think this is all. Oh dear me! Rook G five, King D six, threats of mate on G seven and H eight. Yep. So now he has to bail out. Rook d5. It's, ama it's amazing how, how easily you're able to avoid checks, actually. That's the uh, the thing that's really quite surprising. But uh... Well, of course, my, my bishop deserves a sort of an award. <laughs> it, it stopped him playing rook g1 check a few moves ago. It's just totally controlling the middle of the board. Fantastic. Stopping him going to c, c5 and... You name it, that bishop is the most wonderful piece. I'm sure it was out of sheer spite that he took my bishop. I think, yes. I think that's correct, isn't it? Noggin off. <laughs> Just uh, get rid of that piece. And you played uh, you played queen f7 check. Oh, when you get the draw. <laughs> and then there's uh, this beautiful perpetual. Which of, and, course, um, would, which, of course, Nigel Short would try and take... Would he, would he? No, no, he doesn't like stalemate. Perpetual checks allowed, yeah, isn't it, uh, for uh, for Nigel? No, it's, uh, it's, and what I can remember now is that poor old Dave Rumens, and I think he can be forgiven. He didn't say anything to me. He signed the score sheet and th threw it at me. <laughs> 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 and I, you know, I, I totally, totally empathise with him. I'm, I'm completely with him. And I think that when you win a game as luckily as I did, sorry, draw a game as luckily as I did there, you know, I just, your opponent should be allowed to throw a tantrum. There ought to be a chess tournament ought to have a tantrum room where players are allowed to <laughs> shout and throw crockery or something like that. Because it's so painful, isn't it, when you, when you miss a win like that in such a one position. Yeah. You know, I still feel guilty today getting away with that. It's just ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but 
and in many ways, I mean, he played a fantastic game there. This is, you know, it's almost a homage to David Rumens. But he played a fantastic game, and he was just a little bit unlucky with that final combination. Just one one move in the game that was just sort of suboptimal, and it cost him half a point. But, but it, of course, it was karma, because he'd been winding up poor old Andrew Whiteley about Exactly, exactly. <laughs> this was... This was, you know, yeah. contribution, you know, <laughs> waiting for it. Yeah. So did Andrew Whiteley go on to win the tournament then? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question because I, I looked I looked this up this morning. Oh. In fact, neither, neither of them won the tournament, <laughs> which is quite satisfying. Somebody called Brian Hare won the tournament. And I can't remember him at all. But if you look up, if you Google Brian Hare chess, you'll see a very nice obituary written about Brian Hare. On the English Chess Forum, and he was quite a character as well. If you read the obituary, he died a few couple of years ago, and apparently he was a member of the same club as David Rumen, this famous London club for junior players called um, Cedars, I think it was called. Okay. Um, so e even before my time, this was this was in the early sixties. Um, so he was quite a character, but in fact, David Rumen sort of had the last laugh um, because he won the. Grand Prix. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, although in round five, Andrew Whiteley also had the last laugh because he beat me. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, the bad guy got shot in the end, and that wasn't me, of course. <laughs> oh, John, thanks very much indeed. That was a really entertaining game, and uh, well, actually lovely talking about, yeah, British figures from, from times past as well. I mean, it's... Uh, a lot of um, yeah, a lot of very good players in uh, you know the British circuit at that time who actually aren't very well known uh, um, abroad or anything like that. So it, ah, it's lovely, uh, lo lovely seeing that again. Well, thanks very much indeed, John. Uh, had a really lovely chat. Yes, and, yeah. and uh, you know, I was very flattered to be asked. It was really great to be asked. Well, thank you very much, and I hope the viewers enjoy it. Yeah, catch up soon. Thanks very much. See you then. Bye. Stay safe.